Hi, good evening, everybody. You're all very welcome in this beautiful summer's evening. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't dragged you away from sunbathing. Uh, my name is Norma Sint. I'm a trustee of Belfast Charitable Society, and I'm also privileged to be the chair of the Marianne McCracken Foundation. And this is a very special event tonight. In our 250th year, we're celebrating 250 years of Clifton House, and this is part of our President's Talk series. So a bit of an introduction to our 250th year. The Society first opened its doors in 1774, and you're sitting in Clifton House, which is the oldest working building in Belfast. The Society designed, they fundraised, they built, and they managed it, and provided a home for the most vulnerable citizens of Belfast. And it was set up to care for those in need and to try and alleviate poverty and disadvantage. And 250 years later, we're doing the same thing. And during this year, 2024, our staff and volunteers are delivering very special legacy projects, talks, tours, exhibitions, conferences, and social media campaigns to help tell the story of those years. We've got a strong history of challenge and innovation, and to a large part, this year is going to reflect that. We're going to bring others together to talk about poverty today and disadvantage, and a lot of that is in North Belfast. And we'll be asking you at the end to, to go away and think about what we should be doing today to meet the needs of the disadvantaged. What can the society do as it did back in 1774? So just a bit of an introduction to tonight. We've got the privilege of hearing from Dr. Katrina Kennedy. Katrina, you're, you're very, very welcome indeed. He's going to tell us how the charitable endeavours of women such as Mary Ann McCracken and Martha McTeer enabled them to participate in and influence the radical public sphere of the 18th century Belfast. And just before we delve into the discussion, just a little bit of background on those two remarkable women. Um, this was also known as the Poor House, as I'm sure you know, during 18th and 19th century. Mary Ann McCracken's uncles and father held positions on the board. And sometimes I sit around the boardroom table in here and think how privileged we today as board members are, we have such a, an incredible history. And from a tender age, Mary Ann was involved in the poor house. Um, she recalls visiting it almost as soon as she could walk. She recalls coming to it with her mother and helping with the children. And her formal involvement in the administration of the poor house began in 1827 with the establishment of the Ladies Committee of the poor house. And they did all the work. And um, very often the men would overrule whatever they suggested. So the woman went off and did it anyway and came back and apologised. Mm -hmm. Nothing has changed today. Mm -hmm. Under Mary Ann's guidance, she was secretary of the Ladies' Committee for a while. And she significantly improved the lives of children and women in particular in the poor house. She made sure that they had soap, that they had clean clothes, they were able to get laundry done. And above all, she believed in education. Um, she also pioneered the uh, placements for young, young men in particular, and also young women, so that they would have training in work. And I sometimes think nothing has changed to, today. And the remarkable progress has been documented in the Ladies' Committee Minute books, which we've all been given a copy of recently to read, and it's absolutely fascinating. Um, a lot of it is in Mary, own, Mary Ann's own handwriting. Martha McTeer also had a long-standing association with the Poor House and the donation boards out here in the staircase. You'll find the name of Martha Young, who was Martha McTeer's aunt, and she was listed as a generous donor. And Miss Young bequeathed a substantial sum of £100, that was substantial in those days, to the Poor House. And she also worked diligently to ensure that her aunt, Martha worked diligently to ensure that her aunt's estate was inherited by Dr William Drennan. And he was able to retire and acquire Cabin Hill in East Belfast. So enough about the poor house, and enough about I don't want to, to step um, to, to tell you anything that Katrina is going to do. I'm just simply going to introduce her. Uh, Katrina is a reader in modern his, modern and modern British and Irish history at the University of York. She's published widely on gender and Irish radicalism in the late 18th century including articles on women and the memory of the 1798 rebellion on Martha McTeer. Her book, Women, Politics and the Irish Public Sphere in the Age of Revolution, is forthcoming with Oxford University Press. Katrina, I'm delighted you've agreed to join us this evening, and we look forward to, to hearing what you have to say. We'll have time at the end for some Q&A uh, from the floor and also from 
people on Zoom. Thanks so much, Dora. <laughs> Right. Oh, there we go. <laughs> um, so, uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you so much to the Marianne Clapton Foundation for inviting uh, me to speak this evening. It's always such a pleasure to be in Belfast, and it's a particular pleasure to be able uh, to come here this evening to um, talk about two fascinating uh, Belfast women. And also, thank you to everyone in the audience who made it out in such a reasonable <laughs> weather. So I'm very grateful for that. So the two women I'll be speaking to tonight, we've already had an introduction to them. One of them you may well be more familiar with, Marianne McCracken on the left, to statue um, has recently been unveiled. Um, she was an, uh, a radical Democrat, arguably Ireland's first feminist, uh, a philanthropist and anti-slavery campaigner. And you may be slightly less familiar with the woman on the right, Martha McTeer, um, but like McCra Marianne McCracken, she was an enthusiastic reader of the works of the feminist Mary Wollstonecraft. Um, she was also actively involved in Belfast charity, as well as being closely connected through her husband and her brother to the United Irishmen. So her brother, William Drennan, was one of the founding members of the United Irish Society. Both women were exceptionally long lived, both lived into their 90s. Um, and in their lifetimes, they would have shared uh, a number of uh, friends and acquaintances. And in their deaths, they are close neighbors. They're both buried um, in Clifton House Cemetery. But I'm yet to find any concrete evidence that they ever met. Um, they were clearly aware of each other. So in 1796, William Drennan wrote to Martha McTeer to say that he had met Mary Ann and her sister when they were in Dublin visiting their brother Henry Joy, the United Irishman, um, while he was in Kilmainham Jail. And in 1857, uh, Mary Ann McCracken would remember Martha McTeer as, quote, a woman of first rate abilities. So there are many affinities between the two women, but also some important differences. Um, McTeer, who was born in 1742, was almost three decades older than Mary Ann McCracken. And while both were Presbyterian, they belonged to different congregations. So McCracken um, and her family were members of the doctrinally orthodox Old Light um, congregation that worshiped at the third Presbyterian meeting house in Rosemary Street, while McTeer belonged to the non-subscribing New Light congregation. Um, that was located on, uh, also located on Rosen Street, first congregation. And we might also note the relative, the difference in the relative size of the archives associated with each woman, with each woman. So impressive detective work by Catherine Bronwyn McWilliams has recently identified 181 letters written by Mary Ann McCracken and scattered across various collections. While the formidable editorial work of Jean Agnew has made available um, the astonishing collection of almost 1500 letters that were exchanged between Martha McTeer um, and her brother over nearly five decades. And so Irish historians have long recognised, um, you know, this as an incredibly valuable collection for um, Irish history. But I'd like to make the case that this collection um, constitutes one of the best collections of correspondence by writers from the middling classes uh, anywhere in Europe. It's a really remarkable co uh, collection. It's in the Public Record of Office of Northern Ireland and it is a treasure. So, McTeer's letters in particular 
provide this really richly detailed chronicle of social and political life in late 18th century Belfast and of the intensifying ideological conflicts that divided its citizens over the course of the 1790s as the, the, the town became increasingly divided between supporters of the revolution and the United Irishmen and a loyalist um, conservative camp. So in her wonderful exploration of the contemporary resonance and meanings of the 1798 rebellion, Claire Mitchell conjures up the heady atmosphere of United Irish politicking in 1790s Belfast. When I think of 1798, she observes, I feel waves of testosterone wash over me. All those stories of vivid drunken nights, making resolutions, swearing oaths. I want to go to the pub in the 1790s and make resolutions too, but I'm unsure if a woman is allowed to go to the pub. So Claire asks a really interesting and important question here. Where might women fit into these scenes of hard drinking, toast making, masculine sociability that we know from the journals of United Irishmen like Wolf Tone and Thomas Russell were such an important element of Belfast radical politics in this period? So women weren't admitted to full membership of the United Irishmen and it wouldn't have been considered respectable for women of McTeer or McCracken's background to have gone to the pub. But it may be po possible to penetrate this fog of testosterone to reveal other spaces where women were able to engage in political discussion and to think of themselves as civic and political actors. So this was a period, late, the late 18th century, when politics was constantly spilling into various arenas of social and religious life. So the meeting house, the assembly rooms, and also charitable work. So drawing on the lives and letters of Marianne McCracken and Martha McTeer, I'd like to explore with you how women accessed and navigated this lively, highly politicized urban landscape. So let's begin by taking a tour of Belfast in the latter half of the 18th century. So by the 1750s, poor management by the fourth Earl of Donegal had left Belfast in a really dilapidated state. Um, but then the renewal of urban leases uh, by the fifth Earl in the 1760s led to something of an urban renaissance and the construction of several new public buildings, uh, many of which you'll, you'll probably be familiar uh, with. So in 1769, the exchange rooms um, were uh, constructed. They housed a coffee house and a market house. And then in 1776, an upper story was added um, to that, which housed Belfast assembly rooms. And that would become a venue for balls, concerts, and other social gatherings. And then 1774, of course, Clifton House, uh, where we are uh, today, uh, was opened by the Belfast Charitable Society to house the town's poor house. And the poor house would be partly funded by balls in the assembly rooms. Although I've also just learned from Lauren that this room was also used to host balls that uh, funded, helped fund uh, the poor house. So maybe we can have a bit of dancing mm -hmm. uh, when we're done. Um, and then the elegant neoclassical First Presbyterian Church was opened in 1783, the White Linen Hall in 1784, and then Belfast's first permanent theatre, uh, the Theatre Royal on Arthur Street in 1793. 
So this spate of uh, building work, these kind of public initiatives reflected the growing confidence of Belfast, largely Presbyterian middle classes. And what the historian William Crawford describes as that powerful community spirit that animated the town in the 1770s and 1780s. So in creating these spaces, where the town citizens could gather together for commerce, improvement, discussion and leisure. They were asserting their capacity for self-government and, and challenging the ruling Protestant ascendancy's political monopoly. So Belfast's receptiveness to radical reform in the late 18th century can be traced in part to an increasingly tense relationship between its middling class citizens and the landed aristocracy. And alongside these kind of elegant public buildings, uh, of course, there was a lively infrastructure of pubs and taverns, and they would provide um, important venues for various reformist and radical societies where they could meet um, as they proliferated from the 1770s onwards. But while women were generally excluded from the debating, plotting, and toasting that took place in such settings. There were other civic and political spaces to which they did have access. And perhaps foremost amongst these was the Presbyterian Meeting House. And one explanation for um, Ulster and Belfast's affinity for democratic politics in this period lies in the self-governing structure of the Kirk. And in principle, at least, the Synod of Ulster and after 1747, the Burger Synod, allowed congregations to vote on the election of their minister, irrespective of gender. So it seems that unmarried or widowed women who were heads of household um, were it seems included in the church constitution. So the records of the Belfast First Congregation, for example, show that Martha McTeer was one of five women who in 1801 voted to dismiss the, the congregation's clerk. So they were exercising or participating in some of that um, ecclesiastical kind of democratic government. And throughout the late 18th century, the Kirk was not only a site of religious worship, but also of civic and political association. In the 1770s and 80s, Belfast ministers played a leading role in the Irish volunteers, so the patriot movement that was campaigning for greater legislative and economic independence. So at Belfast's first congregation in 1778 and 79, the Reverend James Crombie delivered a series of sermons for the Belfast Volunteer Company, urging the necessity of political and military mobilization. While the Reverend Sinclair Kelburn, minister of the Belfast Third Congregation, where the McCrackens worshipped, famously preached in his volunteer uniform with his musket propped up against the pulpit door. So these were very politicised spaces. So for women like McCracken and McTeer, this was an important forum for political engagement. And the centrality of the meeting house to Belfast civic and political life would also be evident in the fact that they were often used to host town meetings. So these are quite, quite routine features um, of Belfast life in the period where they would um, call the citizens to assemble together, often just to discuss quite pedestrian issues about improvements to the town, but during the 1790s, increasingly they're discussing very controversial um, and difficult political issues. And it's at those meetings that you can see the fissures between Belfast, kind of more radical, moderate and conservative camps beginning to open up. And it's clear from McTeer's letters that she often attended those meetings. So for example, in December, 1792, 
she was present at one of the most significant uh, meetings um, of that era held at the second Presbyterian church, which you can see at the back of the first Presbyterian church there, um, where a packed assembly debated whether or not the time would issue a resolution declaring its support for full and immediate Catholic emancipation. And again, in March 1795, she would attend another town meeting um, where the, the citizens debated on a resolution to present to the departing Lord Lieutenant Earl Fitzwilliam, again declaring their support for Catholic emancipation. And at that meeting, McTeer noted to her brother that she was the only woman present, but she didn't say that her presence was uh, remarkable or remarked upon. Nevertheless, she seems to have seen when she attended these meetings, it was clear that she saw her role as being a kind of critical listener, but not an active contributor. And her access to these kinds of political spaces seems to have been conditional on her remaining a silent presence. So that's a kind of marker of women's qualified access to Belfast's public sphere. And that state of qualified belonging can also be seen in uh, McTeer and the Kraken's membership of perhaps one of the most significant institutions of late 18th century Belfast associate, associational life. And that's the Belfast Reading Society, renamed the Belfast Society for Promoting Knowledge in 1792, which of course um, is now the Linen Hall Library. Originally founded by a group of radical artisans and tradesmen, or worthy plebeians, as McTeer dubbed them, it was originally intended to provide a forum for education, self-improvement and political discussion. And it clearly, although it, it had a mixed, a politically mixed membership, um, the society did publish resolutions in the United Irish paper, the Northern Star, declaring their support for Catholic emancipation. And from 1794, um, Thomas Russell, the United Irishman, was the librarian. So it had a radical orientation. And in 1792, the society passed a motion affirming that women could be admitted to the society, quote, exempt from personal attendance, but in other respects, amenable to the general rules. So I'm taking it here that exempt was a euphemism really for excluded. And uh, it's unlikely that women ever attended the meetings of the society. Um, but between 1792 and 1799, nine women were admitted to membership. Um, and Mary Ann McCracken was admitted in 1798 after the execution of her brother, Henry Joy. And similarly, McTeer joined after the death of her husband in 1795. And as members of the society, they would have had access to a substantial collection of Enlightenment texts, as well as political works by supporters of the French Revolution, like Mary Wollstonecraft and William Godwin. So again, it's a, a, an important forum for these women's political education. Perhaps in response to the kind of partial inclusion that they enjoyed in um, associations like this, Martha McTeer would, in the 1790s, carve out a, a kind of space for female literary sociability through the reading parties that she hosted at her home in Belfast. I'm afraid the only image I can find <laughs> to illustrate that it was not very flattering one by Gilray of women reading um, Gothic novels uh, around this time. But the reading parties, the Tears reading parties, were these gatherings of up to 40 women um, at her home, so in a domestic setting, 
um, at which the women would read a play and a selection of poetry and songs would be performed. And there's some overlap between the female membership of the reading society and the women who attended um, McTeer's reading parties. Now, these are more focused on sort of amusement and entertainment rather than political exchange. Um, they chose to read two comedies, so um, Sheridan's A School for Scandal and Shakespeare's As You Like It. But the gatherings did see, acquire more of a radical flavour from the original literary material that was supplied um, by the United Irishman, Thomas Russell, and William Sampson. And they had recently co-authored a number of hugely successful satirical works um, for the Northern Star. So they're getting the top political satirical writers to write some poems, some songs um, for the parties. And we can see McTeer adapting certain elements of masculine club culture for her domestic gatherings. So for example, um, a technique that was widely deployed in the United Irish songbook, the songbook called Paddy's Resource, um, which uh, was one of the forms of kind of mass political education that the United Irishmen uh, used. Um, it would often set subversive lyrics to familiar um, uh, loyalist tunes like God Save uh, the King. So they would rework it as God Save the Rights of Man uh, and so on. And, and McTeer does something very similar and she asks Samson if he will write her a song um, to the tune of Rule Britannia about Mary Wollstonecraft. And frustratingly, the text of this has not survived. But given Wollstonecraft's arguments for the parallels between slavery and the condition of women, we might imagine how the chorus would have been adapted. So I like to think, anyway, that the chorus would have been women never, never will be slaves. But she, unfortunately, I can't, I can't prove that's what it was. Um, so McTeer reported she wasn't entirely happy with the verses that William Sampson said, sent, but she reported that the song had been well sung and chorused and much applauded. So it's possible to see in this all-female chorus an expression of female solidarity and in a muted form, cultural resistance that wasn't dissimilar to the kind of communal singing and collective bonding that were so characteristic of radical counter rituals in this period. But just to add, she did stress that her gatherings ended with a rendition of God Save the King. So she's, she's saying these are, you know, they're playing with some of these radical elements but she's signaling this is a constitutional gathering. So while McTeer adapted elements from masculine club culture for her reading parties, this didn't expand into any ambition to join or form equivalent political associations for women. So when she discovered in 1797 that letters she had written to her friend Jane Gregg had been seized by the administration, McTeer inserted a strongly worded protest in a letter to her brother that was presumably intended for the Belfast postmaster Thomas Winery. Let me here declare, she began, that I know of no society of United Irish women, that I never heard it said that there was one in this place, that I never even subscribed as thousands did to the relief of prisoners, that private transactions are my abhorrence, and that I never engaged in any act I should care was known either to the public or secret committee. So these societies of United Irish Women, and I've spent many, many years trying to find out more about them, but they still remain one of the most mysterious uh, elements of Ulster radical culture in the 1790s. In the 19th century, 
the loyalist historian Samuel McSkimmon recorded that several such societies were founded following the suspension of habeas corpus in 1796, and that they were commonly known as teapot clubs, the purpose of which was to gather political intelligence and collect funds for the Republican cause. And writing to her brother in early 1797, Marianne McCracken also remarked upon the appearance of a new female society in Belfast, which she had a great curiosity to visit. But she queried why such a separate association was necessary. And in a perceptive analysis of what it would mean for women to subordinate their own emancipation to the Republican cause, McCracken wrote, I wish to know if these women have any rational ideas of liberty and equality for themselves or whether they are contented with their present abject and dependent situation, degraded by custom and education beneath the rank in society in which they were originally placed. And you can absolutely see in this passage the imprint she's been reading Mary Wollstonecraft. This is very close to the, um, the kind of wording or the, uh, you know, the line of argument uh, used in Wollstonecraft's vindication of the rights of woman. So both McTeer and McCracken claimed no knowledge of these radical United Irish Women's Societies. But in a letter to Dublin Castle written that same year, the Belfast postmaster, Thomas Winery, claimed that it was McTeer's oldest and closest friend, Jane Gregg, who was at the head of the United Irish Women in Belfast. So Jane Gregg uh, was the daughter of the substantial merchant and ship owner, Thomas Gregg, so one of the wealthiest families in Belfast. You can see their names on some of the donation boards um, here at Clifton House. And she never married, um, and she had quite a considerable fortune of her own. And this allowed her to um, a life of kind of relative freedom where she moved between fashionable literary circles in Ireland and England. And you can see here a biographical sketch of Greg that was written um, uh, by someone who met her in Bath in the early 19th century, Joseph Hunter, who was the Unitarian minister there. And Hunter recalled that there were, quote, stories of her having been in some measure instrumental in the political movement in the north of the country in the disturbed times towards the close of the 18th century. And then he continued, there was a masculine air about her that gave some countenance to these rumours. And certainly in, in the lead up to the 1798 rebellion, um, Greg was under scrutiny by Dublin Castle. She was forced to leave Belfast for the relative safety of Manchester. Uh, where her brother lived. Um, but she remains still quite a shadowy figure. Not much of her correspondence has survived. Um, but if this the wealthy, intelligent, opinionated Greg was the director of United Irish Women's Societies, then it's likely they were more than the teapot clubs that um, McSkimmon described them as, or the kind of submissive and subordinate organisations that McCracken feared they were. So McTeer's response to reports of secretive United Irish Women Societies and her abhorrence of private transactions suggests her genuine discomfort with the more violent conspiratorial turn that Republican politics took after 1794 as the United Irishmen transformed into a mass revolutionary underground. Though McTeer's personal connections to the United Irishmen meant that she acquired a reputation as a violent Republican, her enthusiasm for revolutionary politics dimmed over the course of the 1790s, and she often expressed her distress at the political polarisation that was tearing 
Belfast's once cohesive civil society apart. And her account of Belfast's social scene during this decade points to an effort on the part of the town's wealthier inhabitants to try and maintain the neutrality of the spaces where they gathered together for leisure, but also the practical challenges of doing that as the ideological conflicts began to intensify. So that's particularly evident in her accounts um, of the Belfast coteries. So these were ticketed fashionable gatherings, usually held at the assembly rooms. So the assembly rooms at the corner of North Street and Waring Street, which of course would have looked very different um, in the 1790s, that this is, you know, um, much of how it looks now is a 19th century addition, but you can see the beautiful interior um, of the assembly rooms on the right there. And a, there was a suite of chambers on the top floor, one for card playing, another for tea, and then that large room for balls, dances, and musical recitals. So it had a kind of status as a site of genteel sociability. And famously, of course, it was the um, venue for the Belfast Harpers, festival in 1792 and that was partly organized by uh, so there was united irish involvement in that it was time to coincide with the third anniversary of the french revolution but the venue and the involvement of women in the harper's Fe festival kind of contributed to a kind of plight air of patriotic antiquarianism and by contrast the um, event that followed the Harper's Festival that evening uh, was held at the Donegal Arms and that was to celebrate the, the French Revolution and it was a much more raucous um, affair so Wolf Tone um, broke his glass from repeatedly thumping it on the table as they toasted the French constitution, Thomas Paine and the rights of man. So you can get a sense, yeah, the assembly rooms is in, uh, perhaps a, 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 a more of a sociable space where it's somewhere at the Dunnable Arms, which is used to host those kind of political dinners, has a, a more radical flavour. So although the country attracted a politically mixed company that included McTeer and her friend Jane Gregg, overt displays of Republican sympathy were discouraged, <laughs> particularly as the town's reputation as a hotbed of radical Republicanism grew. So on successive occasions in the spring of 1793, soldiers quartered in Belfast rampaged through the town attacking the houses of known radicals and intimidating the local population. And then when officers visiting the coterie um, asked to if they, if they would play, if the band would play God Save the King, they clearly thought that they were being provocative, they wanted to stir um, a reaction. But according to McTeer, the, the, uh, those at the coterie uh, uh, applauded and encored. And this, Mateer wrote to her brother, is the way to baffle at present. So they were wrong to push in the officers who thought uh, radical Belfast wouldn't listen to God Save the King. Early the following year, Mateer reported that a soldier had interrupted the dancing at the assembly rooms, again to demand that the, the band play God Save the King. And again, the company patiently tolerated this, but eventually the threat of violence forced the women to leave the, um, the country as the soldiers began to harass those that they identified as being rebels. So there's a real sense here of, um, you know, this intrusion of military violence into kind of spaces of leisure and recreation. Despite that, there were attempts throughout the 1790s to maintain the country, the assembly rooms, as a space of civil interaction for Belfast citizens. And the idea partly being that the presence of women would help to kind of contain, to moderate the political passions of men. So even after 1796, when General Lake, the commander 
of the British Army in the north was threatening to destroy Belfast, to use the Insurrection Act to destroy Belfast. McTeer reported that the general was cordially received at the coterie. Similarly, Lords Londonderry and Castlereagh, figures that were reviled by McTeer and many others because of their brutal counter-revolutionary campaign, were treated with politeness when they attended the country in 1797. And McTeer's brother, William Drennan, who by then was quite isolated, he'd, he'd left the United active involvement in the United Irishmen and was socially isolated in Dublin. And he was appalled at the way how uh, Belfast citizens could be so cordial to people who were terrorising the province. Shame upon the town, he wrote to McTeer, if there can be such harmony. But the historian of the, the United Irish, uh, Richard Robert Rad uh, Madden, would later claim actually what was happening was that they were, the Belfast Republicans were under this veil of politeness, gathering military intelligence. So he claimed that the, the sister or the, yes, the sister of the radical linen merchant, William Sinclair, ha, um, who was meant to be very beautiful, um, had uh, exploited General Lake's vanity to get vital details on troop movements. So William Drennan, while he rebuked his sister for socialising with those who were presiding over the violent disarming of the North, McTeer was clearly wrestling with the question of how civil society could survive such polarising conflicts. And I think that we can see in her philanthropic work um, an attempt to try and bridge the partisan divisions that were tearing the town apart. So in December 1793, McTeer announced to, to her brother that she'd unexpectedly been elected secretary of the Humane Female Society for the relief of lying in women. So this was a newly established charity that would provide um, care for impoverished pregnant women and um, in effect Belfast's first maternity hospital. So unlike various other um, charitable initiatives at this time um, that were uh, female-led, um, they tended to be led by elite women, by titled women, whereas this was largely, this originated with middling class women, although they did appoint um, Lady Donegal as a patroness and Lady Harriet Skeppington as their vice patroness. Also unusual, for Irish charities at this time, it was entirely governed by women. Um, so, and as with other earlier civic and charitable societies, like the Belfast Charitable Society, it provided experience of self-government. So as well as gathering subscriptions, writing newspaper notices, and securing premises, the women involved were responsible for chairing and addressing meetings, electing the committee, and voting on important questions. And they held their meetings in the card room of the assembly rooms. And McTeer often reported um, their proceedings to her brother in a kind of self-mocking language of a parliamentary uh, proceeding. Um, and she suggested in these reports that the society wasn't impervious to the broader ideological struggles convulsing the town. So when the society debated whether or not to support unmarried women who were pregnant, McTeer reported that those who were in favour of supporting unmarried women were, quote, now deemed Democrats. And just to note, they, they did, in the end, decide to um, afford care to unmarried women. And that was, that was quite a, unusual. So well into the 19th century, um, many similar institutions, in Britain at least, you know, refused to um, uh, support uh, women unless they were married. In 1794, McTeer had begun her own informal school for a small number of poor girls who she collected in the morning and taught to read at home. 
And she actively seems to have encouraged their political education. So she taught them to read using newspapers rather than the Bible, which of course is the standard text for most other charity schools. And she also taught them to write as well as read, uh, whereas more conservative educational charities often only taught children to how to read. And I think she understood her charitable work in terms of a broader politically progressive project. At the same time, she was prepared to collaborate with women whose politics and outlook were more conservative. So in 1795, possibly inspired by Matira's example, the women who were involved with the Humane Female Society um, set up or planned to set up a, a school for impoverished um, girls. Um, and this was known as the Union School, and it would be Belfast's first free um, permanent school. And with the exception of McTeer, the Union School's committee was dominated by women associated with the town's moderate and loyalist camps. So there was Lady Harriet Skeffington, who came from a prominent family of aristocratic evangelicals, and she was married to Chichester Skeffington, who was sheriff of Antrim. There was Isabel, Isabella Joy, wife of the moderate Henry Joy, and Isabella Brown, whose husband, John Brown, was sovereign of Belfast. So they were very much part of the political establishment. So the union of the school's title may have alluded to the spirit of non-partisan interdenominational collaboration in which it operated. So with dissenters working alongside members of the Church of Ireland, loyalists cooperating with a figure like McTeer who had strong connections to the United Irish Movement. And McTeer's commitment to working across partisan divides in her philanthropic work was underpinned, I think, by a desire to model the moderation and respectful dialogue that by the late 1790s was proving increasingly elusive to Belfast men. Um, and this is particularly evident in her relationship with Lady Harriet Skeffington, who was the kind of director of the Union School. In McTeer's letters, she often made a point of relating her civil discussions of public affairs with, as she put it, quote, this dignified methodistical woman with moderation on both sides. And the two women would exchange reading material that was written from opposite ends of the political spectrum. So Lady Harriet would send uh, Martha um, kind of uh, uh, accounts of the horrors of the French invasion in Europe, you know, to kind of warn against uh, revolutionary republicanism. While Matir sent um, uh, uh, Lady Skeffington um, articles that uh, William Drennan had written for the United Irish paper, the, the press. So this was, a, you know, as I said, a dialogue that was becoming increasingly difficult for men to sustain, particularly around 1796, um, when uh, the Belfast yeomanry is being raised and men are being expected to um, uh, make a public oath of loyalty or to enlist in the yeomanry, whilst the United Irishmen are also pushing um, increasing numbers to choose their side. So you have to choose a side in, in some sense or else you're going to get run over, you know, there's no, the middle ground is being eroded. And McTeer is conscious that her, in some ways that her gender spares her from having to make those kind of public avowals of loyalty. Um, but she was less sympathetic though to the complaints of her brother William Drennan, who by that point was being shunned uh, by his comrades in the United Irishmen because he wasn't actively um, involved. And in one letter where he's kind of making these complaints, he anticipates McTeer's brusque response uh, to his lamentations. Um, uh, and he goes on to contrast 
the apparent ease with which McTeer was able to navigate the political polarities of the 1790s with his own painful state of exile. You will say, he writes, look at me struggling with the world and rising above it, proud in my penury, social in my loneliness, the cement of humane societies, the mental mother of neglected children, a female Democrat respected alike by Bristow and Bruce. So here she's referring to, uh, he's referring to George Bristow, who was the Anglican sovereign of Belfast and a loyalist, and William Bruce, who was the minister of the first congregation and was a reformer kind of turned loyalist. Uh, and he says, you alike can attract the visits of Samuel Nielsen, so ed editor of the Northern Star, the Irish Jack Belfast Jacobin, as well as conservatives like Lady Harriet Stepneyton. Mm -hmm. As include, this is all true, but this only makes you as much my contrast in society as you are in your sex. By the time of the 1798 rebellion, any hope that a moderate course could be steered through Belfast's divided political landscape had been violently dashed. Even those urban spaces that had once been considered more neutral territory became battlegrounds. At the outbreak of the rebellion, Henry <laughs> Joe McCracken, for example, had suggested that the rebel forces might attack and take hostage General Nugent, commander of the British Army, um, while he was attending a concert at the Assembly Rooms. And as it was a little over a month later, it would be Henry Joy McCracken who was tried and sentenced to death at a court held again in the Assembly Rooms. And a question that has preoccupied historians of George and Belfast is, how did this formerly tight-knit community stitch itself back together again after the dreadful events of 1798? How could those who had been involved in the Republican movement recover a sense of civic identity and purpose? So the, Jonathan Jeffrey Wright and others have shown how the Belfast United Irishmen didn't just withdraw into sullen silence, in the early 19th century, they increasingly channeled their progressive energies into non-partisan philanthropic and literary initiatives. So like the, the Linen Hall Library, the Belfast Academical Institute, and literary periodicals like the Belfast Monthly Magazine that William Dredden edited. While those histories, they tend to focus mainly on men and what they did in the early 19th century, but I'd like to make the case that the philanthropic work of McTeer and later McCracken may have provided a model for the male urban elites who would try to rebuild Belfast civil society after the Act of Union. While McTeer and McCracken may never have taken the United Irish Oath or toasted Tom Paine at the Donegal Arms, or addressed a town meeting. Belfast was home to a number of spaces of association, the meeting house, the town assembly, the reading society, that fostered the town's precocious republicanism, and that were open to women. At the same time, women's partial inclusion in such spaces also encouraged the formation of alternative female initiatives like McTeer's reading parties or the Humane Female Society. And these associations were in some sense radical, but they were also able to swerve the polarization and militarization that by the end of the decade had so embittered Belfast's public life. In so doing, they were perhaps holding together the delicate fabric of civil society so that it might be stitched back together after 1798. Thank you very much. <laughs>